So as you all know, uh, it takes a few minutes while everybody logs, uh, everybody connects. We'll give it another minute or so. So okay. Well, we've we're slowing down uh, in the. Uh, we've pretty much reached the plateau right now in, in connection. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Eisenberg. I'm handling the technical aspects of this program. Uh, just to remind you that this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you, but there is the Q&A function at the, um, usually it's at the bottom of your, your view, but it, uh, on a few rare instances, instances it's a it's at the top. Uh, type your questions at any time, but we will be asking the questions at the end of the presentation, but they can just stay in the queue. Uh, and there is a chat that will be available, but the chat is more if you have information that you would like to share, but if you, you, we're not gonna be able to read any questions in the chat, they're too hard to find. So that being said, uh, Let's get started with this uh, excellent program. I turn this over to uh, Jack Walworth. Jack, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending our event today on Go Green with Gray Water, how to water your landscape with recycled household water. I'm Jack Walworth. I'm a member of the Glendale Environmental Coalition's Outreach Committee, and I'll be moderating the event. This is one event of a four-part series that the Glendale Environmental Coalition and Sierra Club are hosting. Verdugo Hills Chapter is presenting this summer to help inform the community on ways to apply environmentally friendly solutions to different aspects of your daily lives. In June, we had an event on composting and food waste management with the City of Glendale's Public Works Department. In July, we had an event on landscaping for wildlife prevention and home hardening with the battalion chief fire marshal for the city of Glendale. And later this summer, we'll be covering techniques for eco-friendly landscaping and yard maintenance with the American Green Zone Association. We'll post a link in the chat to our webpage to see recordings of our past workshops as well as information on our upcoming workshop at the end of today's meeting. During the course of today's event, please type any questions you have in the Q&A, and we will do our best to get to all of them at the end of the presentation. Now I'm thrilled to uh, present to you today's speaker, Laura Allen, founding member of graywateraction.org, to teach about how homeowners can go green and have green yards with a gray water system. Thank you, Laura. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks everybody for taking time out of your Sunday to learn about this important topic. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll um, start talking about gray water. And this is recorded, so you don't have to take furious notes. Um, so as you're probably aware in California, particularly in Southern California, it takes a lot of water to keep our landscapes alive and lush. And typically it's about half of all the water we use goes outside. And our landscapes don't need the same quality of water as we do in our homes. And that's why it's such a great match for a recycled water supply like gray water, residential wastewater, which is only wastewater if we waste it. 
And so just to kind of get us on the same page, what is gray water? It's water that you use in your home. It comes from your washing machines, it comes from your showers and your baths, and it comes from your bathroom sinks. So it's a little bit dirty, has a little bit of soap and grime and uh, hair and lint, but it can be a great source of irrigation water for your plants. Kitchen sink water is actually not considered gray water in California. It's kind of an odd thing. Other states do consider it gray water, but in California, just the bathroom sink goes with these other gray water sources. And so before we get started with the presentation, I just want you to stop and think for a minute. Think about, is gray water right for you? And I know you're curious about it. You're interested about it. Maybe you've already learned something. Maybe you even are using it um, already. And so these are a couple of questions to be thinking about as we go through the presentation. So if you're concerned about the water crisis and you want to save water, gray water is an excellent thing that you can do if you have a landscape to irrigate because you're going to be directly replacing that potable water with your household gray water. It's also great if you want a lush landscape in your drought prone climate. When we have droughts, there might be water rationing restrictions. It's the right thing to do to cut back on irrigation for sure. That's super important, but you actually don't need to sacrifice your landscape with if you implement a gray water system. I'm gonna talk more about what kinds of plants you water. It doesn't mean you can just, everything can stay the same. You just replace your uh, whatever you have sprinkler system with gray water, that's not how it works and I'm going to get into that, but you can offset and you can irrigate many types of plants to have a very beautiful and productive landscape using your gray water. Gray water is right for you if you can take some personal responsibility with your water, being mindful about what goes down the drain. When we use gray water, whatever we put in the water, whatever shampoos or detergents we're using now is going out to our yard. So it's important to be mindful. I'll talk more in detail about what kind of products you can use. You don't have to go to a fancy store. Um, you don't have to probably change everything, but you do need to be mindful and you might need to make a few product changes. So your water is going to be a good quality for your plants. And again, we'll talk more about that later because that's really important. And then if you want to save time and money by learning what's the best system for your situation, this is really important because gray water is so site specific. It really depends on your home, your landscape, how much water you have, um, all these factors. And so it's really prudent for you to take a little time to, to learn about it so you can put, pick the right system the first time and be successful. And being here today is a great place to start. So there's two main ways to use gray water. The first way is for outdoor irrigation. And I'm gonna focus pretty much the entirety of this talk on that, on that um, way to use gray water. If you have a yard, if you have plants, it's so much easier, more affordable, um, works better to, to send that water out to irrigate. Gray water can also be used to flush toilets and you know, it may kind of offends common sense to be flushing our toilet with potable drinking water, but to get gray water to be a quality that's good enough to go into your toilet tank, to sit around in your tank, to not cause any problems with the flushing mechanism, to actually get gray water to that quality is a rather um, complicated, I shouldn't say complicated, but it takes a lot more filtration, disinfection to not cause other unforeseen problems or unintended problems. So those toilet flushing systems are really best suited for large buildings that have like, you know, very large, like multi-story um, commercial scale where somebody's maintaining the building and someone can maintain a system that's just going to be a lot more complicated and take a lot more maintenance to keep up and running. So if you're thinking about gray water for your residential home, think about outdoor irrigation first. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to focus on simple systems. I'll talk about more complicated systems a little bit at the end, but simple gray water systems are really well suited to irrigate larger plants, larger plants being trees, bushes, vines. They can also irrigate larger annuals and perennials. Um, think about like the size of a tomato plant and bigger. The reason is just a logistical um, consideration. It's not about the quality of the water. It's just that when you're larger plants, they need more water. So you can send gray water to a few different locations and now you've maxed out your gray water and met your irrigation needs of your plant. It's really hard to send gray water to a lot of different places like a drip irrigation system does. And so with a simple system, it does really well to send the water to a few different locations. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like in a couple minutes. Uh, lawns are not suitable for a simple gray water system and lots of tiny plants are not suitable. There are complex systems that can irrigate those type of landscapes. It won't be in a sprinkler. Sprinklers are never going to work for gray water in this country. They're disallowed, um, but a subsurface drip irrigation system can be um, an option. 
And so I'll take a minute to talk about products. These, I'm gonna call them plant-friendly products. So what you're gonna look for are products that don't contain a lot of salt. Uh, if you think about like a powdered laundry detergent, it's full of salt. So you don't wanna use a, any type of powdered detergents. Um, salt will build up in the soil over time and can harm your plants over time. It's not a one-time use. So if you one time use the wrong product, it's gonna have pretty negligible to none, no impact. It's over time build up. The other component is boron. Boron is a plant microtoxin, so it can harm your plants if it builds up over time. It's in some laundry products, um, it's in some cleaning products, so you want to just make sure you're not putting any extra boron into your system. And then chlorine bleach, that also is not a good thing. You're always going to be able to shut off your system, so if you do need to use products that aren't plant friendly, you can turn it off, but you want to get products that you use on a regular basis that are plant friendly that you can send out into your landscape. Uh, and once you do that, the water is suitable for irrigation, for long-term irrigation, of any kind of plant that wants to be irrigated, and you can just replace the irrigation with gray water. I have a couple examples up here. Um, Ecos, Biopack, Trader Joe's has a liquid laundry detergent that's suitable, Oasis, Vasca, um, there's a whole bunch. So again, you can find one of these in most major grocery stores or Trader Joe's, depending on where you shop, um, but you do need to know what you're looking for. In the shower, it gets a little bit less of an issue because shower products are pretty much all liquids. So shampoos and conditioners, they're pretty diluted. You don't use a lot of them. And they're, they're again, not going to contain boron and they don't contain much salt. So showers are a little bit less of a concern, though your cleaning products in the shower, that might be a problem. So you want to make sure you're cleaning with uh, either shutting off your system or cleaning with products that are maybe um, hydrogen peroxide based instead of bleach, instead of chlorine bleach or vinegar based instead of like a white powder or just using very minimal quantities. Uh, and then if you have softened water, that really depends on where people live. Some people have water softeners and sodium-based water softeners are not good for gray water. And so I'm gonna to touch on some other kind of general important things. Uh, these are some safety considerations. So gray water is not potable. We're really accustomed to irrigating with potable water because when you turn on the hose, it's coming from your house, that's all potable water, the same water that's coming out of your kitchen sink but gray water is not potable. So there's a couple of considerations. You don't want gray water to pool up. You don't want um, people to access it, pets, children, you don't want mosquitoes to grow in it. So it should never, there should never be puddles of gray water. You don't want people to have direct contact with it. Um, you also, it has to stay on your property and soak into the ground. So it should never run off into a storm drain, which leads to creeks or rivers. It should never be too close to a creek or river. And that's to prevent the nutrients in gray water, which uh, nutrients in your garden, that's called fertilizer, that's a good thing, but nutrients getting into a waterway, that is pollution. So it has to stay on your property. And then it should not be used to irrigate root vegetables because the gray water is not potable. It could have germs in it. You don't want those germs to get on food that someone then eats directly. So it's you're avoiding a direct ingestion of a non-potable water. Other things that grow food like fruit trees or grapevines or berries, the food's above the ground, the gray water's below the ground in the soil. There's no contact with the water and the food. So that's totally fine to use for that type of plant. Um, so with these simple gray water systems, we, there's a couple of components that are very important that may not seem like a gray water component. When you think of gray water system, you might be thinking of pipes and tubing and valves and that kind of stuff, which they, they are there too. But there's something else that's really important. The first, it's called mulch, which I'm sure you've seen in landscapes. It's used in lots of landscape features for water efficiency to keep down weeds, et cetera. And in a gray water system, we use it as a filter. So it's an in-ground filter. It's not covering the entire landscape. So it's just a, a distinct location. You dig what's called a mulch basin. So you remove soil about six inches to a foot, you fill it with wood chips and that's where the water goes. The gray water is filtered through the wood chips, then it hits the soil and soaks down and that's where the roots access the water. So you're going to be near the plants that you want to be irrigating. It works very well. Um, it's taking what could be considered a waste product and using it into a resource. It builds soil, it builds organic matter in your landscape. It requires very little maintenance. About once a year you need to maintain these basins. But other than that, your system is just using nature to uh, clean the water and feed your plants. And your systems also are going to have a diverter valve. So there's always a way to redirect the water to where it's going now. So if you have your home, your water is probably flowing to the sewer plant. And with a gray water system, you have this diverter valve that allows you to either send it to your landscape or back to the sewer, or if you're on a septic, back to your septic system. 
And kind of lastly, before we get into systems, if you don't design your gray water system properly, you're not going to save water. And I know that you guys are, I'm assuming that most of you are here because you want to save water. And I want you to save water with your gray water system. To do that, you need a little bit of information so you can design your system properly. Um, the system you're seeing in front of you is from Long Beach. That grass is green. You can imagine that grass is being irrigated. The people wanted a gray water system. They put in some new plantings right in the middle of their grass, and then they kept on irrigating the grass with their existing system, which was a sprinkler system. So now they're double watering some plants and they aren't actually saving any water. This is an improper design. Technically, I'm sure it was fine. They used all the right parts. They got all the water flowing out there, no problems, but the design was not done properly because it's not saving water. So you wanna make sure that you are situating your gray water plants um, in a separate area. You can cut, cut back the irrigation. So if you have sprinklers, you can turn off some sprinkler heads. If you have drip, maybe you can cut out a zone or cut or cap some emitters, really depends on your site, but you wanna be stopping the irrigation you were doing and replacing it with gray water. That is how you save water. Or if you haven't planted yet and you're doing a new landscaping, you're going to be only feeding it with gray water. You're not going to be double watering the same area. Okay, so let's talk about some successful design. The first step is to understand your options. And I'm going to go really briefly through some of the different systems and you can get a sense of what might work for you. Where do you want to go for further research? Can just give you a little taste of what's out there and know where you can go for more information. I'll give some resources at the end. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to call them tried and true systems. So these are systems that have worked for many people for a long time. There's lots of things you can do. You can tinker, you can play with systems, you can try things out and that's fine. But if you want a system that you know is going to work and you know other people have, have used it and understand the maintenance um, and the longevity, then I'm going to recommend you, you look towards these tried and true systems. You want to pick one that's going to match your home and landscape, meet your needs. You want to know how much they cost, how complicated they are to install and make sure that also is a match for you. And you also want to understand the maintenance requirements. And if you're going to do the maintenance yourself, make sure that it's doable. And if you're going to hire someone, make sure you have someone who's able to do that maintenance for you. And some systems are very little once a year maintenance, others are more, more frequent. So here's one. Um, this one is called Laundry to Landscape. This system has, is only coming from a washing machine. The washing machine has an internal pump in it. It pumps out the water. And so what you do with this system is you direct that water, you, into, you put it into a valve. You can see that diverter valve in the picture. And one side of the valve goes back to your sewer connection. So literally nothing has changed about your home. So when the valve is turned one way, you're, everything's flowing just like it did before. But when you turn the handle, now the water flows out to a new system that you have constructed. So you have to get out of your house. You need to have an exterior wall or a, a crawl space. You can go through the floor and then out through a crawl space, but you do have to have a way outside. And you design a system where you're irrigating plants. Uh, this picture is kind of conceptual. Everything is above ground, you can see, but really this is all buried. And I'll show you a few photos um, in, a, in a minute. You can see the cost is relatively low if you do it yourself. This is totally doable for a do it yourself first. So if you've put in a drip system, if you fix you know, things that break in your house, you can definitely install this system. If you don't have time or you don't uh, work on your home, you can hire someone. It's usually a one to two day project, depending on your setup. And I should mention there's no permit required for this um, as long as you follow 12 basic health and safety guidelines, which are really easy to do. So here's some pictures. Um, inside plumbing, you can see that diverter valve uh, is right by the machine. So it's really easy to turn the handle, send it either you know, wherever you want it to go. The picture on the left, it's going through the crawl space. That pipe goes down and out of the crawl space. The picture on the right, that is an exterior wall. So it's popping straight out through that wall into the landscape. Here's a construction picture in the landscape. The tubing is, it's similar to a drip system, but everything's bigger. So that main line tubing is a one inch in diameter. The lines, the feeder lines going to the basins are half inch. So this, the di diameter is large enough for all the lint and debris to flow through and out. And then the filtration happens in the wood chips in the landscape. So we're not trying to catch any of the gunky stuff in gray, gray water beforehand. We're letting that flow out, hit the mulch, decompose in the landscape and then the water flows down into the soil. So this picture is not fully finished. Um, here's a finished picture, everything's buried. All you see are the tops of those little, um, those little green caps. 
and that is preventing roots from clogging up the gray water system. Um, let me go back for a sec. The bottom of those little black containers is open, so the water is just flowing through some air that prevents clogging of roots, and then it flows into the mulchin landscape. So on the left, you can see that's a row of fruit trees being irrigated. The picture on the right is showing different perennials and some trees being irrigated. So once it's done, there's really not a lot to see. Um, if you have a basement washer, you can't, so this, this system, let me go back one slide, uh, has limitations, which I'm not gonna go into all of them because this is an overview, but there are limitations. And one of them is how far can that pump move the water? When you get into more details, if you're pursuing the system and you find out, oh, my washer's in a basement, I can't rely on my washer basement pump, excuse me, the pump in my washer to pump out of my basement and then out to my landscape, you might need to have some other um, auxiliary pump. And then that's gonna be a similar but slightly different system. So I just want you to know that if you have a basement by chance. So now um, all the other kinds of gray water systems, you have to change the plumbing. So that triggers a plumbing permit. Um, it shouldn't be hard to get a gray water permit, but um, it kind of depends on who you're asking, what city you're in, all of those considerations. And, but it, it should re be relatively straightforward. And many places in Southern California around Los Angeles and Pasadena have done a lot of work to make it pretty straightforward and easy for people. But again, it, it kind of depends on who you talk to. So, um, don't take no for an answer. If you want a permit, you can definitely, you should be and, and can get one. You just might have to be a little bit persistent depending on the, the, the situation. But you're triggering a plumbing permit because you're altering your plumbing. So now you've tapped into your plumbing, you have a diverter valve that's in your plumbing and now you send out the water. The simplest way is through a gravity flow system. So this system works really well, but it only works if you have a yard that's lower than your pipes and you can get out to your yard. Uh, works well for small flat yards or downward sloping yards. So with this system, it's called a gravity flow branch drain system. The water flows by gravity, it goes out, it's diverted passively through, um, it's a, a fitting that separates the flow into two, like half goes one direction, half goes the other. And you have a couple of those, so you distribute the flow appropriately. You figured out how much water your home produces, how much your plants need, and that's how you've made that design, how you figured out how many plants to go to. Um, Water flows by gravity out to your plants, into these basins, and feeds your, your trees. This system works really well for trees and bushes. It's hard to go to a lot of places, so you don't really, you probably won't be irrigating um, anything smaller than a bush. You can see the cost. It's a little more. It takes a lot more time to install this. If you're a do-it-yourselfer, um, you can put in the gray water system, the irrigation side, putting in the valve, that really depends on your plumbing. If you have straightforward, just plastic ABS plumbing, you can put in that valve, it's not a problem. But if your home is older and you have cast iron or steel or other complications with the plumbing, you're gonna to wanna to hire a plumber to put in that valve because you know, once you start changing plumbing, you wanna be prepared to fix anything that happens along the line um, with old homes, especially. So may take a little plumber, may not, depends on your situation, but the technically it's not hard to put in the, the irrigation, but it does take a lot more time. If you want to hire somebody, it takes a lot more time again, so the cost is a little bit higher, as you can see. So here's some pictures. So there's the valve. You have to be able to get under the home. So if you have slab on grade foundation, this doesn't work. Um, these homes have crawl spaces, or if you have a basement, that's really good because there's a lot of, a lot of room. Um, you can see the picture on the left. The water's flowing down into the crawl space. There's the valve. One side's going to the landscape, one's going to the sewer. The one on the right, this is showing a motor that you can attach to that valve and that way you can control it by a switch in your home. So if you have a true crawl space, you don't want to crawl you know, through the house to turn off your gray water system. It should be really easy. So you have a switch in the home and you can just turn the switch and then control the system that way. And here's some pictures. You can see um, this is a very small yard, so you can kind of see all of the piping going out in the basins. You can see the plants being planted adjacent to the basins, and so the water is going to feed uh, those plants. The roots are going to grow and access that water. And there's that same system finished, and then one year later. Okay, so now we are <clears throat> in systems where you can't use gravity. Maybe your yard slopes uphill. Maybe you have a big patio that you have to cross before you get to your plants. And then you're gonna to need to pump your gray water. 
Um, <clears throat> sometimes people think they always need to pump their gray water and that's not true. Pumps are used when needed, but I really discourage you to add components that you don't need because it adds cost, it adds, um, you know, resources that you're using for your system and things that could potentially break. So try to keep it as simple as you can that works for you. So <clears throat> you have a hill or you have a big patio you have to cross. You do need to pump your gray water. So first you have to access it. You need to put in that valve, just like in the previous example. So you have to be able to get to your shower pipes. You, now you send the water out to a small tank. It's not storing gray water. It's called a surge tank. You're just collecting it temporarily. And then when the tank fills up, it's usually about a 30 gallon tank. When it fills up, the there's a float switch on your pump. When the float goes up, it gets engaged. You pump out all the water into your landscape. A simple pump system doesn't have any filtration at all until you get into the mulch basins like the other examples. So it's really low maintenance. You're using the really similar irrigation side as that first washing machine example. It's going through one inch tubing. It has half inch outlets. There's really nothing to clog until you get into the landscape. It can take all the uh, debris, lint, hair, gunk, and catch it in the wood chips, and then that's where you're gonna do your once a year maintenance. Um, of course, with this, you have to plug in the pump, so you need a power source. To get a permit, it tends to be a little bit more rigorous of a process because now you have non-potable pressurized water, so that's a more of a potential concern. So just know that this will be, um, it's definitely permittable based on the code, but it might be a little bit harder uh, because of it's pressurized. Here's some pictures. The picture on the left, there is a basement involved, really easy access. The picture on the right is a crawl space. So the tank is buried partially in the crawl space. So that was more um, effort to install that system. And so the last kind of system are pumped and filtered systems. So with this kind of system, you're, you want, so let's say you wanna send gray water to a lot of small plants you need to filter the water because the simpler systems are just not able to distribute it to so many locations. So the water has to be filtered and then put into a specialized drip system. Um, that is great to do if, you, if that's the type of landscape you have and you need to do that. But when you're filtering gray water, now you have a filter and filters are the number one failure point in gray water systems. The filters are designed to clog. That's the point. They're catching all the gunk before it goes into your system. So, Somebody, you, maybe a contract with someone else has to clean that filter. There's filters that are self-cleaning, uh, excuse me, that are, you have to clean them yourself. And then there's automatically clean filters. So I'll show you kind of two examples. But I really, if you're thinking, oh, I need to filter and pump my gray water somewhere. I really want you to stop, step back and think, do I actually need to filter my gray water? Or could I just have a simple pump system? If you're just watering trees and bushes and uh, you figured out you have enough water to water maybe 10 of your plants, you could probably easily reach that with your simple pump system. Uh, but again, you might find out, no, I do need to filter my gray water. And then you would go down the route of finding a, a system that's gonna work for, for your needs and be able to be maintained uh, adequately by you. So here's the overall example. The water goes into that tank. So just the same as the simple pumped, but now it's being pumped out through a filter and now it can go into a specialized drip system. You can't just replace this and put it into your existing drip. Gray, even filtered gray water is not clean enough to go through a standard drip system. It has to go through a special drip that's designed for dirty water. So here's some pictures. Um, this one is a manually clean filter system. They have to be cleaned and people tend to forget. So I would highly discourage this kind of system unless you get a maintenance contract with the installer or with someone else and they come on a regular basis and clean your filter. Again, number one failure point. Um, that picture is just an example of drip. That's not a gray water drip, but just so you can see the water is being spread out evenly over a large area versus all the other examples I gave you. That's kind of like spot irrigation for your bigger plants. And here's some examples of filtered systems where the filter is cleaned automatically, and that's a good thing. Um, but to get that to happen, it's usually back flush with potable water. And so now you have much more uh, concern for permitting up reasons because you have potable water coming into a non-potable system. So you, if you don't do this right, if it's not installed properly, it could contaminate the potable water supply, which is the worst thing that could happen with the gray water system. So the oversight is much higher and it should be because you really wanna make sure that your system doesn't cause any problems with the drinking water. All those other systems are completely disconnected. They're separate. There's no connection with the clean water and your dirty gray water. 
these ones are different. So um, they're more expensive. Um, they're more, you know, they're more automated. They're mostly put into new construction or um, big, you know, remodels where a lot is being done. Um, often people seeking like LEED certification or some kind of, you know, green certification. The cost is vastly different than all those previous systems I showed you. And so I want to end as a, with an example of a great um, mix between and, and this, this section of where you can use simple and more complex systems. Evergreen Lodge is a resort in the Sierras and they recycle 1.8 million gallons per year. And they have little cabins and then they have some more centralized locations that are producing gray water. Their cabins, all their guest cabins, they have these simple gravity flow systems where they're just irrigating the landscape near the cabin. So you know, if you stay in the cabin, your shower water is going to water the landscape right by the cabin. And there's 55 of them. So it's a lot of, a lot of gray water systems. It works really well. The landscape's beautiful. Really, you know, no energy is required. It's all flowing by gravity. Perfect situation for this. Then they also have a commercial laundry, and that's a lot of water going from, you know, one location. And so with that system, with a lot of water, they're sending it through a pumped and filtered system and distributing it out into the, the forest through drip irrigation. It operates all year long. It's really a great example of the choosing the right system based on the needs and the site. And so now that you have understood your options and you know where to go for more research, you kind of have a general sense of these different systems. So now you're going to look at your site and there are site considerations that I'm just going to touch on these so you know what you would be doing. We're not going to really go into detail about this at all today. So you have to look at the slope of your land. Of course, that will impact do you need a pump or can you use gravity? You have to look at setbacks. So in the code, there's some requirements that are designed to prevent un problems that you don't want, like bothering your neighbor or having gray water go into the street. And so there's setbacks where you have to stay a certain distance away from property lines, um, from creeks, you know, things to protect the environment as well as the people around you. You need to look at your soil type. Uh, sandy soil, the water drains quickly. Clay soil, it drains more slowly. So you might need to spread out the water a little more if you're working in clay soils versus sandier soils. What plants are best suited and how many can you irrigate? Um, so you need to understand your plants, how much water they want and choose the right plants for your situation. And then look at which fixtures you can access. So this is all gonna be kind of, all this information is gonna help guide you to choose the right system for your situation. And then it's also good to consider other reuse options. Maybe you're considering rainwater, maybe a rain garden, other things. And so thinking about how would these work together to meet your overall goals and make sure you don't situate one that's going to prevent you from doing something else you want to do in the future. So it's not to, you don't have to have like a full site plan thinking about everything you're going to do in the next you know, 20 years, but you do want to just take a little step back and think about what else might you do and how would this work together with that to help benefit your bigger picture plans. So with all that, you're gonna pick your system. These are the common ones, the laundry, the landscape, the branch drain, that gravity flow one, a simple pumped or pumped and filtered. And with that, you'll design your system. Again, this part is really important because you want your system to one, work well and also save water and work for a long time. So I encourage you to take some time with this, do your research, um, and there's a, I'm just going to kind of call out a few of the calculations that you need to do to get a good design. So the first one is how much gray water does your home produce? So that is your irrigation water. So it's not hard to do, but you do want to be, you know, pretty as accurate as you can be knowing, of course, it fluctuates a little bit, but you want to know how much water you are producing because that is your irrigation water. And with that, you can know how much do your plants need. There's some great online tools. There's I'm sure through your group, there's other tools, local resources where you can figure out how much to water your plants. And so you wanna know how much to water, how much you have, and then you do a match. So you're trying to match your production, your needs, and then you design your system around that. So you're adequately watering the right number of plants and you're maximizing your water savings. Regulations, of course, impact your design. Um, and then knowing the health and safety. So I touched on that, but you do want to make sure that you're really thinking it through and making sure that you're following a tried and true system, or if you're trying something maybe slightly different, that you're, you really know what you're doing. If you're not just following um, some recommendations of systems that other people have done a lot and really understand. 
So last step, you're gonna build your system or hire somebody. Um, so the skill level, the launch of the landscape is a very simple system, needs the lowest, not lowest, sounds kind of negative, but it requires the, the fewest skills, I should say. Um, it's great for a do-it-yourselfer. Um, oops, some of the others, like the pumped and filtered systems, there's a lot more that can go wrong. So you wanna make sure that that system's really installed properly. Specialized parts. Um, sometimes these parts are, you can have to mail order them. There are some local stores that carry them, some irrigation stores. We just wanna know where to find your parts. And at the end, I'm gonna give you resources that will answer all of these questions. So you don't have to you know, be guessing or trying to figure this out on your own. You might wanna hire somebody. And so, you know, basically you need the same tips to successfully work with any contractor as you do a gray water contractor. Um, gray water, sometimes people will call a plumber to do gray water because they think a plumber is the right person. The plumber is the right person to change your plumbing, but most of the gray water system is not plumbing. It is your landscaping. It's the irrigation system. And so finding a good landscape contractor, that really is the best professional to install a gray water system because the majority of the system are your plants. The majority of the design is the plants, knowing how much to irrigate them. Um, so sometimes you need to work with two, but for your main person you're hiring, you want a landscape landscaper, landscape contractor that's familiar with gray water. They might need a plumber to do some of the plumbing work, but a plumber is not able to transfer to doing all this landscaping work. There's just too many variables. It's much more complicated out in the landscape, too many things to know. Plumbers know how to alter the plumbing. So a landscaper can, can say, can you put in a valve and I want the water over here? That's really clear instructions versus the, the other way around. Like, can you water this landscape? Um, that's just not a skill set that most plumbers have. So look for a landscape contractor, look for a gray water installer probably don't call your plumber. The caveat is if you're doing a remodel and you want to prepare for gray water, then you really want your plumber to do the plumbing during that remodel. That way you can be ready to go whenever. And um, yeah, so make sure that you can get a plumber to put in the, the system, the, excuse me, the valve, so you can later on put in a gray water system. On our website, which I'll show at the end, we have some downloadable kind of tips for how to do that. It's called gray water ready or drought ready construction. So getting to the resources and then we'll do questions. So gray water action is the, or my organization. We have a lot of information online. Um, we have also books. I've written a couple of books. These are how to books. So they take you step by step through the design and the installation process. So if you're a do it yourselfer, I highly encourage you to Check it out from the library, purchase it. There's online versions as well as hard copies um, because it really will walk you through that design and installation. If you plan to hire somebody, it's a good idea to really familiarize yourself with the system you want. And so you might want to read the design part. You can skip the construction part, but you do want to have a good understanding so you can guide somebody, um, communicate what you want really clearly to them. There's also a design manual. It's called the San Francisco Graywater Design Manual for outdoor irrigation, that's a free download. So you can download that from our website. It has a step-by-step -step instructions for the system. It was designed for San Francisco. So the plant water requirements is gonna be different because San Francisco is much cooler with more coastal fog in the summers versus Southern California, it's much warmer. Plants require a lot more water. Um, so getting back to our website, there are uh, pages for finding an installer. There's a hire installer page where people who've gone through our training list themselves up there and you could find someone that's had training and maybe a lot of experience. There's kind of a range of newer installers to very seasoned installers. We have past webinars that are available for free. We have Mandarin uh, Chinese language resources. We also have Spanish language resources on the website. And then we also have a forum. So you can put in any question in the future. If you, after this webinar, maybe you try something, maybe you go to your home and you have a question. You're like, oh, she didn't answer this question that I now have you can put it on our forum and we can answer it there for you. And lastly, we are doing some online classes. So we have um, two classes. We have like some free just kind of classes that would cover similar info to what you're getting today. We also have some more in-depth classes that really go into all the aspects of gray water design. One, gray water design mastery. That's a, a class that's live weekly. Um, we're gonna run another one in the fall. So if you're interested, you can get on our email list and get announcement when it's, um, posted. The other one you can take any time. It's called gray water fundamentals. That really goes in depth with all of the theory behind gray water and how you can reuse it. So I'm going to end there. 
And thank you all for again, taking time out of your Sunday for this topic and we'll take questions. You mute. There we go. Jack? Thanks, Laura. Um, I think, uh, are we back to regular video here, David? Sure. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Laura. That was uh, amazing. Wow. Um, I. I have one of your books here. I just wanted to flash that for everybody. This has uh, a lot more than just the gray water, but it's uh, a great book. Can't say I've read it all yet, but uh, there's a lot of great information in here that uh, I've gleaned already. And now it's time for questions. Uh, David will um, uh, read them off from the Q and A. Okay. Um, Take it away, David. Okay, I, I have a question. It's not quite obvious to me. Uh, you showed the the laundry to to irrigation, and you showed the showers to irrigation. Uh, can you mix them both together? Is that or is that more complex? Or is it better um, to put two separate? So it it will depend on your setup, but most homes when they're if your home is already built, you have everything. You're living in your house. This is your your house. Here it is. Usually your washing machine is not right by your shower. Um, the washing machine has the pump in it. So it's much easier to distribute that water by using the washing machine's internal pump. So there's not really an advantage to connect it to your shower because now you're, you're going by gravity. So it's not that you can't do it. It's just that it usually doesn't give you an advantage. It actually makes your life a lot harder if you want to send out the water. Um, the, unless you have to pump your water anyway. So if you have to pump your water anyway because of your upward sloping yard or your patio or whatever reason you need a pump, then it might make a lot of sense to bring those two waters together into your tank and be pumped out. Um, so somebody was asking, you know, with fits of the laundry, they have a backyard pool and if they wash the swimsuits uh, is the chlorine in the swimsuits an issue in watering yeah i would say that that's pretty negligible quantity and that it wouldn't cause a problem that would be my intuition um, it's different than putting a lot of actual like straight chlorine bleach into your system it's it's like a trace trace amounts or small amounts diluted with a whole load of laundry so I, if it was my home, I wouldn't worry about that. But I may, or if I was, I might just rinse them a little bit before throwing them in with the other clothes. Okay, I have a quick question. Um, what's the issue with uh, kitchen sink water? It's illegal, you say, in a lot of places. In California, I guess, right? Yeah, I like to call it pre-legal because this is a regulation that I really think should be changed. Um, kitchen water is gunkier. It's got grease and food particles. So it's definitely more prone to clogging, but that's a design challenge. It's not a, is the water safe or, or unsafe? Um, the reason is like, I could go down a rabbit hole because um, I can, my brief answer, and I can go down a rabbit hole if anyone really wants to hear my long answer is there was a study done and kitchen water is, a, is lower quality and they found some, on, some unhealthy germs in the water. Um, pathogens, foodborne pathogens. But when you think about, well, how did they get in that water? They were from, I mean, from the kitchen. So someone was washing their raw chicken. They were holding the chicken in their hand. It was on their counter, on their knife. Like what is, what's riskier? Like bringing that raw meat into your home and washing it and preparing it or having it go out into your system through a gray water system, land below ground in your landscape. Does that make sense? Like, but they prohibited you to use that water because of the quality of the water, though the reason it was a low quality was because of what you were doing in your house, in your own kitchen. Got it. Got it. What, what, and what about dishwasher? Um, uh, dishwashers, they just lumped it in. Um, it does, dishwasher detergent is typically a little lower quality water, but 
you know, you, the reason when you ask people, why is kitchen water banned? If you ask like regulators, mostly they don't really know the full reason. Most people, cause you know, they, they have to know a lot of things and it's such a teeny tiny detail. But what most people will say is that it's not safe. Um, or some people might say it's the grease, you know, it'll clog up filters, but you don't have to have a filter in your system. So it's not, in my opinion, it's not a compelling reason. It's not health and safety. Um, it's a design consideration. Other states like Oregon allows it. There's several, there's I think 17, well, there's a handful of states that do allow it. And then there's more states that don't. As long as you have a, a proper area to let it decompose with the mulch. Yeah. You would definitely not want to put it in any type of system with a filter that has like filters the water before it goes out because it's super gunky. And as you know, I mean, any people, have, <laughs> If you wash dishes, you kind of know what, what goes down the kitchen drain. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Uh, my house is on a slab. And based on your presentation, what, what are the options if, if you're on a slab? If you're on a slab, look at your washing machine. Um, if your washing machine's in the middle of your house, it might, it's not looking too good for gray water reuse, but if your washing machine has an exterior wall, you can get out. Sometimes the washing room, there's like maybe just a bathroom or a closet in between the washer and the exterior. And so you can run a pipe like behind the toilet or through a closet. Like sometimes there's ways to get outside, even if you don't have an exterior wall, but you do have to think in your mind, like how could I get a pipe from my washer out to the yard? Um, the showers are not really gonna be an option unless you do a major remodel where you're getting into the piping of your home. Um, you can put, another option is move the, move the washer or put an outdoor shower. Some people like having an outdoor shower. Some people put their washing machines outside in a little shed or in a back porch, covered porch, something like that. And, and how far typically will water, can you run water over flat ground? on the on a non-pump system um, if it's from the washing machine 50 feet is about how far you can go using the internal pump of the washer if it's a shower gravity flow system then your pipe is sloping downward by a quarter inch per foot so that means every four feet you have to go down one inch so you just end up getting deeper and deeper so the farther you go the deeper you get and the harder it is to move the pipes around so you I'd say usually between, if you're like 10 and 20 feet away, that can usually work. Um, but if you're trying to go really far and you have a flat yard, you, you don't wanna use a gravity flow system. You'll end up being way too deep. Well, we have a question. What, what happens if you travel and you go on a vacation for a couple of weeks and you, you know, if you have a regular irrigation, you can have it automatic, but do you have to revert to regular irrigation or? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you can, if you had a system that, and maybe you shut it off, like you had a drip system and you turned off one zone to put in your gray water, don't remove your zone, just leave it, just have it shut off with a ball valve and then you turn it back on for going on vacation. If you don't, if this is your only source of water, then you either need a house sitter to use your, um, use the machine or, or in the shower or you need to have a supplemental irrigation. Like maybe you could just lay something on the ground. Like you might have to do a little extra work. Um, or just don't go on vacation. <laughs> no, people need to go on vacation. <laughs> we have, we've done that for, for long enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The, just for clarity, if if the if the washing machine and the shower are next to each other, they can easily be combined. There's no reason not to. Um, just to, to you want to think about how you're going to irrigate. So if you don't have to have a pump in your system, it is so much easier to put in a laundry to landscape system for the irrigation because it's being pushed through by the washer. It's so much more work to put in a gravity flow system because you're meticulously sloping your pipe and. Um, so if you're going to have a gravity flow system, I would really encourage you to keep them separate because your life will just be so much easier and you can reach more plants farther away with your laundry to landscape system. 
But again, if you're not, if you have to pump for whatever reason, then you can just put them in the same system. And the um, 35 feet would be within range of that uh, if, if you're on a hill? Um, a flat yard can go, flat yard can go 50 feet. If you're going uphill, then you need a, a pump. And I don't think we have this issue in Glendale, but it is, is freezing an issue? Um, yeah, not in Glendale. <laughs> <laughs> but in some, if, if you live where there's hard freezes, you definitely want to make sure all the water drains out of the pipe. You don't have places where there could be bellies of pipe. Um, there's different freezing strategies that I don't really think I need to go into unless somebody's calling in from a different location. And, and, and one of the people said, you know, they, they, they're vegetarians and they take their dishwater outside and water the garden now. It, and so they're looking forward to being able to have a system where they don't have to do that, just go right down the drain. So it's just this general comment I thought was yeah. interesting. Um, and just to verify, uh, we have a question. Um, can, if the gray water is filtered, can it be used in a pool? No, I wouldn't think so. Mm -mm. No, filtered, filtering gray water is to prevent clogging of your irrigation system. It's just a physical filter. So it's not fully cleaning the water. So filtered gray water is still non-potable. There are systems that filter and disinfect and then it's called, um, oh, I'm blanking, but it's a little bit in the code, a different classification and you can do other things with it, like store it for longer, um, possibly put it into sprinklers though California won't let you no matter what there's like a few other things you can do with it but you would never be able to have direct bodily contact with it so it wouldn't you, you should look at other sources like you, you, toilet flushing would come next before a pool like the first look for irrigation then look for toilet flushing then look to these other non-potable requirements um, that a home might have that's not going to have any contact direct contact with the water. What's the issue with the uh, sodium? Uh, is, it, is it really quite bad for a lot of plants? Yeah, it's a buildup. And so it's a little, um, if, if salt builds up in the soil, it prevents uptake of moisture. So the plant can actually become dehydrated even if there's moisture available. So it inhibits uptake of certain nutrients and moisture. Um, so it can be really bad, you know, salt buildup can really make soils inhospitable to plants. Um, but a, a teeny bit of sodium every once in a while, flushed with rainwater, you know, there's all these ways you can keep your soils healthy, adding compost. Um, you also need to factor in the quality of water coming in, like from the tap. So Colorado River water, which I don't, is Glendale on groundwater or, or metropolitan? Water? Uh, both. Both. That's okay. So question. you would want to, if you're like trying to grow salt sensitive plants and you really need to go deep into this issue, you wanna look at the quality of your tap water because that comes in, like some groundwater is very salty. Colorado River water can be quite salty. Then if you add salt to that, now you're, you've really heightened the salt level, if that makes sense. So I would wanna- there's, there's a lot of salt in a lot of shampoos and soaps and mm -hmm. detergents, right? Shampoos, not very much. Um, powder detergents that white powder is like salt like it's a anything with a powder is very high salt and i would say is not suitable for gray water anything liquid is much better um i would definitely read the ingredients for boron but like liquid shampoos i i don't even people well there's a separate concern there's like is this shampoo good for my human health and that's a separate concern because some shampoos have all sorts of weird chemicals in them that aren't good for humans, um, but that's not really a plant issue. It's a personal health issue. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, you know, we can't put the gray water into the pool, but if you empty a pool or a hot tub, can that be used for irrigation uh, or does it need? Um, I suspect there's something you're supposed to do with pool and hot tub water. I'm really don't know. Um, I've never lived with a pool or a hot tub. So yeah, I'm not sure. 
it seems like it would be a big waste to just not use it, but I don't know the quality of the water. The, well, all that chlorine. They have the chlorine and they have the yeah. or bromine. Yeah, I, I don't really know. Sorry. So we have two people asking the same question. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the newer washing machines are very water efficient. Does that reduce the, um, is there still enough water to be worth the using for gray water and the new efficient ones? Mm -hmm. So it depends on how many loads you do a week. If you are like a single person, if you do one load a week and you have a really efficient, maybe 10 gallons per load, that's gonna only water one tree. Um, so you would need to weigh all of the, the whole situation. Like if it was me and I only had 10 gallons a week, I might invest in some other efficiency. Maybe I'd invest in, I don't know, some, you wanna look at your, res your financial resources and then think about how you can save the most water. And maybe the gray water system is not at the top of your list. But if you have that efficient machine and you have a family of five and you do 10 loads a week, then you have, you know, 100 gallons. So, so do you have a, a resource on your website to calculate, uh, to estimate your gray water use, how much you would produce? Is there a Yeah, in, um, in both of my books, there's details about that in that manual that you download, that you can download for free. There's um, a calculation to do in there. I'm not off the top of my head. I'm not sure if it's just straight on the website or if you have to download the manual. But it is available, and and I put that in the chat, so uh, it's available to everybody. Uh, it's the first link, uh, graywateraction.org. Uh, the um, there, there there's a question about in the Evergreen Lodge, you know, a lot of the backcountry lodges use a septic tank with uh, uh, lines that leach the water out. Mm -hmm. is, is, the, is that effective for irrigation for the bigger plants or is it better to use to, you know, to put it as separate lines? Um, well, Evergreen Lodge has a septic and because there's all the toilets and the kitchen, there's a few kitchen sinks going in. Um, they have water limitations too. So to have this you know, lovely landscape, they're growing all these you know, native plants that do need some water to look nice. And it's a resort lodge. So of course they want their landscaping to look really nice. So they do irrigate them. Um, to do all the irrigation and have full occupancy was, is a lot of water. And they were concerned about their well and having enough water. So by using the gray water for the landscaping, they were able to cut back a lot on how much water they were pulling out of their well. And the septic system was only receiving the water from a much smaller amount, just the toilets and um, I think a few other sources. So they can work together really well um, to meet different needs like conserving water and treating wastewater. Septics, the, the leach lines, if it's a traditional like older version of the septic, they are quite deep. So they're, of course, the trees will access the water in that general area, but you're not able to design it to, to actually irrigate. Um, the advanced septic systems do go through drip irrigation often, and but California doesn't allow you to intentionally irrigate with treated wastewater on treated black water. Okay. Some states do. And, and we have a question about the timing um, because the, um, it seems like it, it, it's the water's produced and it goes to the irrigation. Is there a way to time it so it, it goes at more efficient time? If you, you know, obviously it's better to water it and at sunrise or sunset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with these systems, it's all subsurface, so the timing issue is a lot less of a concern. When people are doing a sprinkler system, they're spraying these tiny aerosols of water into the hot you know, summer day, it's evaporating like crazy. That's when it really is important to water in the morning and the night because you don't lose so much to evaporation. But with gray water, you're not losing to evaporation because you're already covered by at least two inches of wood chips or you know, some type of cover, that's a code requirement. So it's much less of a concern. Um, if you really want to do the timing, you're going to take yourself away from a simple system and you're going to get into a much more expensive, complicated, things can break, not work right type of system. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that 
you're not allowed, you can't do it with a simple system and you now have created other challenges for yourself and a lot more cost for yourself. And the benefit you get is I would say rather small. So um, I heard that there's a rebate or something available from Glendale. Do either of you know anything about that? Yes, uh, yes, I actually available? received that uh, $500 rebate that you can get for installing a gray water system. Um, so look that up on the uh, Glendale Water and Power uh, website. They, they offer that, they, they give you a $500 uh, rebate on your bill. So uh, that's an added bonus. That's great. That's $500. If you're a do-it-yourselfer, that's gonna cover your whole system. And Unfortunately, if not, it, it's going to cover a chunk of your system. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we pretty much have some uh, redundant questions, uh, so uh, that have already been asked uh, that I haven't pulled out. Um, the The guide to how much water for each plant is that on your website? So if somebody wants to know about citrus trees or you know, other plants, is there, is there? Yeah, I'll tell you a really, um, a short calculation and then I'll give you a great resource where it does it all for you. It's an amazing online um, tool. So the short answer is you need to know the, the square footage of your plant. This is called like, imagine your plant, like the shadow of your fruit tree. So it's going to be a circular shadow. So you need to calculate how big of an area on the ground that covers. So it's the area of a circle, it's pi r squared. So you look at your trunk to the edge of the branches, that's the radius of your circle. You multiply that by three and three again. Um, so basically, so may, maybe your, let's say your fruit tree is, the trunk to the branches is four feet. So pi r, excuse me, r squared. So it would be three times four times four. So we would get to about 48 square feet. So now you know the area and you just cut that number in half and that's your gallons per week. That's very rough, but it's a pretty good, it'll get you in the ballpark of how much to water that plant. So if your area is 48 square feet, 24 gallons per week about for that fruit tree. Peak irrigation, summer. Um, so that's giving you in the ballpark. The website where it does all of the calculation for you is called Puddle Stompers. And it has these different apps. So I. I didn't give this to you ahead of time because I forgot this is a great resource, but I'll put it in the chat in a second. Um, it's called Puddle Stompers and you can use their different apps. One of them is called How Much Water and you put in your location. It pulls up the weather data. So this is based on historic weather data, which is typically how much your plants are gonna need based on your climate. And then you put the, the type of plant, is it a high water use plant, medium or low? Fruit trees are typically medium and you put the size of your plant. And then you punch calculate and it spits out a gallons per, you can choose per week or per month. Um, so that's pretty much the, the questions that haven't already been answered. Um, and uh, thank you for, we got uh, some good comments, very interesting about the sodium. Thank you very much for a great presentation. And thanks for the books and, and we'll explore the classes and uh, thank you. This was great. And thank you. Very informative. So I don't know, Jack, if you have anything you want to discuss. Uh, yeah, I did, I'm just going to questions. I'm just going to wrap everything up here. Thanks so much, Laura. It's a great presentation. Lots of good information. I have a million questions, uh, but we don't have a million minutes to go through them all. So let's uh, say thanks everyone for uh, coming to this event. And um, uh, we've learned so much here from your presentation. Um, it gives me more incentive to uh, read through more of your book and re redesign my system. Um, uh, these, uh, the benefits of, uh, uh, of conserving water through this technique should actually be law. We should uh, make new construction all using gray water, but uh, that's another story. Dan, are you on here somewhere? You can uh, get that started. Um, 
So I hope everyone's enjoyed this. For those of you that are watching live, uh, we're gonna be uh, uh, sending you a, uh, a post, uh, uh, an email with links to today's uh, presentation. We'll also be posting a, a recording of the presentation on the uh, TEC.ECO website, along with links to many of the additional resources, including, uh, including Lars. Um, there's um, also a recording of the pre previous events on composting and food waste management and landscaping for wildfire prevention and home hardening. In September, the Glendale Environmental Coalition and Sierra Club Verdugo Hills chapter will be presenting another event with the founder and president of the American Green Zone Alliance, who will be take, uh, talking to us about how to transform your yard into a residential green zone and providing techniques for eco-friendly landscaping and yard maintenance. Uh, changing from those gas blowers to electric blowers, et cetera. Uh, so please visit um, the gec.eco slash education dash series um, where you can learn more about these events and how to register for them. We look forward to seeing you again later this summer and uh, don't forget to look at uh, Laura's uh, website that has all these wonderful resources and can help you make decisions about your gray water planning and uh, look at the classes she has to offer. Thanks everyone. Good night. Bye.